up. I couldn't uh, chat to you without one of the scariest and most controversial things I suppose I've seen happen to cyclists in recent times. Uh, you get mugged mm. in London out training. Yeah. So what happened on that day that you got robbed in London? Talk us through that. So I was just finishing up. Uh, I was like three hours, 40 minutes into a ride. I wanted to get four on the clock. I was doing another little loop and I saw these two, uh, two guys on motorbikes, uh, two motorbikes with two guys on each bike. Uh, with balaclavas on and i was like fuck you know i know what's coming here uh like no helmets just balaclavas uh, balaclavas and helmets but like the visors up and i saw see them see me and like put the visors down and i'm like i can go there which is uphill so i'm gonna uh get you know done there like so i turn the bike around this is with them 100 meters to the right turn the bike around like um, put it in a big gear so it didn't look like I was chase like speeding off. Put it in like the eleven, took it up to like fifty five, sixty k an hour, like super aero, thinking that like, I can get to that cafe, which is four hundred, five hundred meters away. But yeah, they just rammed the f- bike into me, like f- just don't care. And I, I was on my nice uh, bike that I spent five, six months building. So it wasn't a, it was one thing losing the money, one thing losing the bike, but then it's another thing sourcing the parts and the hassle and ag that goes with getting the bike exactly how you like it, setting up the levers, how you like them. I was really comfortable on that bike. Uh, anyway, so they knocked me off. Uh, I fell down on the floor. I'd like tried to put it on. I thought I could go on the grass here. Their bikes are better on the grass. I could do this. I could swerve that way. And I tried to like, shut shut the door on them uh, in my peripheral vision uh, as they were coming up to block the road but just rode into the back of me like the weight and the weight of those bikes the scooter just knocked me off so i'm on the floor and did they come down as well uh, they were like all over the place like wobbling their bikes they, they nearly crashed them or well, one of them nearly crashed and then there was like a pickup bike behind anyway the the front one's like all over the place and the second one's like, to- now I'm on the floor. They're like turning me down the road on the bike. And like, I'm hanging on to this bike, like getting scratched up on my legs and stuff. But yeah, in the end, uh, they just whipped out the trouser like a long machete. And I was like, I've, I've, I've tested the water here. Like they, they're going to take this bike. So even if they start yeah. waving that thing around, like I'm only going to end up, even if they have no intention to use it, like I'm only going to end up losing like a hand or an arm, uh, which is not really worth it. But I, I, I tested the water yeah, out well, and, and they, they, were gonna, they, they wanted the bike. So they, like, even if I got to the cafe, they would have just walked in with a machete in my face. So. And is this a, I heard a couple of things around London of similar uh, robberies. Is it resolved or is it ongoing or was there any resolution? The problem is that, the police are so good. Like they were able to track down a group of 10 people. This is ha- this happened in the days after it happened two weeks ago as well. It didn't happen for the whole year in the interim, but it happened. Uh, there was an attempted one last week. So they'd like, they did it to me in a, few, a couple of times after, and then they've, they're like striking again now. Anyway, the, the police is so good. The trouble is identifying, right? These people, the police were able to identify the people, like get images of my bike being taken on the telephone after the event on this guy's phone. Uh, and they have forensics that he like had handled the bike or whatever uh, at the scene. Like the power meter has the, the R of SRM rubbed off like it's my bike, it's identifiable. So any rational person would go like no question about it but the they're fighting the case now they're going down that avenue it's still ongoing they're going down the avenue of uh, he's influenced by other people uh and it's just really difficult for the police you know we talked off air my background's law the wheels of justice move slowly and it's frustrating exactly like i know the guy's name they identified the four uh, three of the four people that did the robbery um, and now it's just a quick case of prosecuting. It's still ongoing and I'm confident that it will all be done. Uh, he, he'll get something for it. But like the, the important... Cyclists are quite exposed. They are. And, and I just actually want people to feel safe on the roads. Like when this was happening a couple of weeks ago, I was like, 
I can just do without going out on my bike and getting robbed again. Because when this uh, one happened two weeks ago, I entered the gate that it happened for training 12 minutes after. So it could have been me again. But it's not nice for anyone. You know what? I I think... I don't know. This is my theory that these guys don't know what the expensive bikes are. I think you could be riding an entry-level Trek 1000, but if it's blinged out and it's green or it's pink and it looks flashy, they're like magpies. They go, oh, that's expensive, even though it's a 600-pound bike. You could be on your 15,000 bike, but if it's blacked out, like I'm riding at the moment a Cervelo R5, but it's black on black, there's not even any... It's full-on Batman mode. You know, the decals are off the wheels, decals are off the frames. It looks like it's worth, you know, a couple of hundred quid. Yeah. So I think you're less of a target when you're on the blacked out stuff. But, you know, it's obviously not always possible being sponsor compliant, etc. No, no, you're, you're 100% right. They just want something shiny. And they, the police even identified the pathway. So they will lose these bikes for like a grand. There's like a network that the bikes are filtered into. They remain in the London area. Like they'll go to North London or East London or whatever. Um, they might be stripped down a bit, but often not. And the guy that's supplying these bikes to the black market will just like take another grand on top. Uh, and he's just a regular nine to five guy who like works in Tesco's or, uh, you know, for the Royal Mail or someone, you know, like that. And uh, just wants a few quid extra on the side. But the the detriment to other people. These, these people riding these bikes, it's their life and passion, you know? Um, and it means a lot to them. Yeah, and you know, also, you don't know, you don't know someone's individual circumstances. Like, that's somebody's mode of transport. Mm. It's the way to feed their family. It's, you know, their, it's their livelihood. It's maybe, you know, a pro cyclist on the way up that needs this tool to make a career for themselves and they can't afford a six-month setback to save up for new equipment. It's, It has pretty grave consequences. This was an extract from my conversation with Alexander Richardson. If you want to check out the full podcast, you can click here and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.